All right, joining uh, James and Darren up on stage will be a couple of uh, very special guests as well. Our first uh, guest is Dr. Jimmy Batella, who's a professor of plant biology at the University of Queensland. Let's get him up on stage. While he's doing that, I can talk about the fact that he's obtained... Yeah, you can give him a round of applause. Why not? Let's do that. <clears throat> he's got degrees in things that I don't even know, didn't even know existed. Well, he's got a degree in quantum chemistry from the University of Madrid, a PhD in biochem, also from Spain as well, and he's joined the University of Queensland uh, in 1995, where he's founded the Plant Genetic Engineering Laboratory, specialising in the fields of tropical and subtropical agriculture biotechnology. Welcome, Jimmy. And you've just come back from, um, from P&G, Papua New Guinea. Yeah, all right. We might get you all just to switch your microphones on, just in case. Now, also joining us today is an Australian author and science communicator and principal of a company that's with his own name. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Julian Cribb. He, is, uh, he and his company provide specialist consultancy in the communication of science, agriculture, uh, food, mining, energy and en environment, and his career includes appointment as newspaper editor, science editor for the Australian, uh, director of national awareness for CSIRO, and is a member of numerous uh, scientific boards and advisory panels, and is the president, current president of the National Professional Bodies for Agricultural Journalism and Science Communication. Welcome, Julian. All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in welcoming our panellists? Now, I do feel like one of those moments where I, I want to be, um, you know, like Springer, okay? So we might have one of those moments. You've got to just keep it, keep it above board, if that's all right. But we might actually start, can we start with you, um, you uh, Jimmy, to start off with? We heard from Chris Riddell all about the way technology is changing. And a lot of that was broad and generalised on what we as human beings are going to encounter. But let's bring it into the industry as such. What are your thoughts on um, whether technology can actually help this industry and in what way? Well, um, is this working? Yes, it, it should uh, be. Okay. Yes. Um, first of all, my apologies because I did pick up an ear infection in PNG. There's all kind of bugs in there and one actually bite me in the, in the ear. Right. Um, um, so, gents, if... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no problems. <laughs> no, uh, look, um, how, you, how do you feel about that, Julian? You wanna, you're, you're okay. He's with me. <laughs> um, look, um, the truth is that the, the, the future of agricultural science as we know it, uh, the old agricultural science is pretty much dead or is dying. All the new technologies that we think that we can use in the shops will come to help us in terms of developing new agricultural techniques and uh, agricultural tools. Uh, I gotta say that CRISPR, I'm, I think I'm invited here because I was working in CRISPR for a number of years now. CRISPR is, is a revolution. We just published a paper where we got uh, two varieties that are grown in the Shanghai area, rice varieties grows in the Shanghai area. We CRISPR one single gene and we made them from normal rice to sticky rice. Wow. Everything else is absolutely the same. Same agronomic you know, characteristics, same growth media, all you needed to introduce one single mutation in one single gene. And now those farmers have the choice of growing normal rice or sticky rice, but they know how to grow it because they've been growing it for several generations. That's the power of technology that we have today. And uh, you might say, oh, what is this? I'm coming up with my coffee. Uh, this is a coffee mug. Well, this was a coffee mug. It's now a smuggling device. No. Um, <laughs> well, we have used microelectronics, and um, um, what you can see now is a powerful real-time amplification machine. And uh, that is the kind of machine that costs $30,000 and it weights 20 kilos and you have to have it in a real lab. And I was using it uh, last week throughout the uh, uh, rainforest in PNG oh, to analyze. I've just broken it. No, it's okay. There's nothing here. It's just the bug to analyze uh, samples, coconut samples, and tell whether they were uh, uh, healthy. So this is not only CRISPR, all kinds of technologies are coming to me, and you might say, how do you know this? Because this doesn't have a screen. It actually is Bluetooth. It communicates with my phone, and my phone controls everything and gets all the results. So technology is coming to our help. We need to embrace it. So we've got it from anything from uh, a slight change to the genes, um, to change the way the crop grows or what sort of product it does, all the way through to analysis as such. Now, I, I might go to you, Julian. You know, the target is doubling our productivity and halving our waste within basically 12 years. 
Um, we've spoken about how technology can do that, but is that um, going to help us, uh, I suppose, feed the world? Uh, we heard Rod, did, were you in Rod's session this morning? No, I no. Wasn't. Well, probably, probably good that you weren't in one sense, um, because he was somewhat confronting in the in the issue that we're, we're basically was saying we've got too much population, we're not doing things the right way. I'm I'm doing the politically correct version of what he was saying, but how do we actually um, double the productivity? Is it going to work? Uh, yes, it is, but we're in for some nasty shocks. Uh, first of all, we're running out of water. We're, we're we're heading into the world's biggest water crisis in the 2020s. So uh, we've, we've already seen big cities like Cape Town, Sao Paulo, 20 cities in India are currently critically short of water. Five billion human beings are going to be critically short of water by the mid-2020s. So that's mm. the first one. Secondly, we're wasting 75 billion tonnes of soil a year. You know, that is a totally unsustainable system. Farming is not going to cut the mustard to feed 10 billion people in a hot world you know, come the 2050s, the, the way we've been doing things. So we've got to radically change this. So food is going to undergo a, a, a fantastic, a dramatic revolution. Um, part of the, this revolution is that half of the food production in the world is going to move off farm and back into cities. Right. For the simple reason that cities trap or half the world's nutrients flow through cities and then we dump them in the ocean. Yeah. That is crazy. In a world that is going to be starved for nutrients in the latter part of this century, we have, to, we have to recycle those nutrients. So, Julian, can I push a little bit from what um, Chris was saying earlier? Um, he spoke about driverless cars and driverless trucks. If I the, extrapolate that a little further, it means a driverless car means that I don't need to park because my driverless car will take me into the city and then drive home and park itself, which means we've got a whole lot of car park buildings that might be available for some sort of hydroponic agriculture, as an example. Is that what you're thinking about? Uh, half, half the world's food is going to be grown in cities using the recycled water and nutrients within those cities. So you're talking about agritecture, you're talking about hydroponics, aquaponics, you're talking about new ways of using sunlight and things like that. We're also talking about a phenomenal increase in the diversity. I mean, at the moment, we humans only eat about 200 different, uh, different plants. Mm. There are 27,000 edible plants on this planet. So we haven't even begun to explore the earth in terms of what is good to farm and what is good to eat. So there's a phenomenal increase in diversity coming down the line. We're going to have to get better diets. Why? Because three quarters of us now are dying from diet-related diseases. The current diet in the world today is, is really crook. Uh, so, and horticulture is going to be the mainstay of this revolution in the diet. First of all, because you can grow fruits and vegetables in cities using the recycled wastes that we've already got. And second, because th that's going to help prevent the diseases that are now killing us. Mm -hmm. So horticulture is really going to benefit. I mean, horticulture has boomed in the last sort of 20 or 30 years. When, when I was an ag journo, I wrote a headline saying, horticulture is our next billion dollar industry. And I was ridiculed, you know. Yep. I was delighted to hear it's now a $9 billion industry, you know, and it's going gangbusters. But wait until you see what's coming down the line, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it's going to be spectacular for horticulture. Does that mean anybody who's a grower should be thinking about how do I grow differently? Yeah, I think you should be thinking, all right, I've got a, I've got a rural farm but I want to start investing in some of this city technology, exploring what it is. I want to start talking to some architects about how they recycle water within a building, yeah. how we work the, the light issue and things like that, how we recapture the nutrients from that building and reuse them, what sort of a ch nutrient chain we build. You know, do we need to include insects or, or uh, aquatic animals in that chain? And so on. So, yeah, we need to be looking at these so, complex systems. At, at the risk of becoming an antagonist for a second, um, you know, rural property is relatively inexpensive. R the real estate's relatively re inexpensive, but city-based pro CBD properties are very expensive. What can we do to, say, negotiate the rooftop, as an example? Well, the rooftops are free, you know. I mean, at the moment, I have a friend, an architect in London. He calculated that London can meet 80% of its fruit and vegetable requirements wow. just on its rooftops. And that doesn't in include all the rest of the other areas, you know, small allotments, what have you, that, that where it could be. So those are the sorts of potential things. Yes, cities can very extensively feed themselves. Wow. But here's the, here's the catch. If they don't, we are going to see some horrible disasters. When a city of 10 or 20 million people... All their food arrives on trucks, right? Today, no city can feed itself on Earth. If that river of trucks breaks down because there's a war or a flood or a, you know, an oil shock or something like that, that city starves before the end of the week because we've got a just-in-time food system. 
So, cause, and the food is coming from thousands of kilometres away. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that we should be uh, liberating carbon in order to move our food from, from one part of the world to another. We, we should be growing much more locally, and that's where the opportunity is to, for horticulture to get into these new technologies as well as the traditional way. So we're talking about how we double productivity in that, in that sense. Um, there's the other side of the equation, which is halving waste, and you've already spoken about, Julian, about how do you use the waste that a city generates. I'm going to go to you, James, if I can. What about farm waste that we're seeing at the moment? What, what can we do about reducing that? Oh, look, I think um, there are a long list of great innovative ideas that growers are using to try and minimise waste at every level of their, of their operation. And, and you know, differentiating products, for example, to use products they couldn't, couldn't otherwise sell. Um, you know, examples of growers like CalFresh and Dailies in Tasmania making vodka out of potatoes and carrots, beer out of carrots. Um, Carrot the, beer. Tastes fabulous. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, actually, I, I, and, but I think that's the, their driver is all farm productivity and profitability, which is unsurprising. But I think you know, the question that comes to my mind listening to Julian and, and Jimmy is, well, actually, who will be the farmers of tomorrow and how do farmers of today think about positioning themselves to be part of that model if that's, if that's what they want to be? And that's well, a much greater challenge and, frankly... Um, I think the industry has given much thought to it. It's a mindset change, right? But you can be a grower, it doesn't matter where you're growing. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Well, interestingly, you spoke about uh, being able to reduce waste. I hung around, I don't know if you, any of you went to the CSIRO stand in the trade show, um, and they were talking about um, broccoli powder. I know during morning tea break there'll be broccoli lattes coming as a means of using the bits that you can't sell as produce. But they also had broccoli snacks, which were strangely delicious. They were, weren't they, right? And I, and I see that, so, oh, by the way, they're going to, um, it's not a plug, but this is something for those of you who are interested, if we join um, technology and so on, I understand that the CSIRO guys in the morning tea break are going to print some food. Mm. Right? They've got a 3D printer with some food, so that'll be something to, to look at. And maybe that's a question. Should we be looking at, in order to reduce waste, ideas like that, that you can take something that doesn't necessarily look saleable and convert it into something that looks like it's printed food, as an example. Yeah, I think there's a whole long list of, of, of innovation that's going to change how we grow and, and feed our, grow food and feed ourselves. And the debate about whether you know, um, proteins grown in a laboratory can be called meat is a, is a great example of the issues we'll have to deal with. But, and, and I think that'll happen as a normal course. Or, or plant-based mints, as we're starting to see hitting the shelves right now. Yeah, that's as right. Example, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, my, that's my point. Yeah. Um, the, the, the broader, the, and the, but, the, but the broader question is just how the industry structures itself and how we go from a relatively agrarian agriculture to this, this, this notion of food factories that Julian, you describe. I think that's extraordinary challenge that the industry has to get its mind around. I think it's quite exciting as well. Well, it's a fabulous opportunity, yeah. but if, only for those that can get ahead of the game, I think, because otherwise a lot of us will be left behind. Are they ahead of the game, Julian? Oh, look, th there's an awful lot of horticulturalists doing this worldwide at the moment. I mean, th th there are these you know, urban food farms springing up, and people are, are investing. I've seen up to $55 million on vertical farms being invested in places like Rotterdam and, and uh, uh, in Canada and places like that. So incredible sums of money. But what about places like Australia? Australia, look, we're, we're blessed with enormous quantities of land yeah. and relatively cheap water, so we're not under the same pressure. Look, look, Singapore is a classic example of a place that's under terrible pressure, you know. They've got to start, they, they are already recycling their water, they're now starting to recycle their waste. Shanghai is, go, is building an urban forest, you know, yeah. so that's a city that's greening itself because they realise, you know, it's just a horrible bloody row of tombstones. I mean, cities are such ugly places compared to what they're going to be once we start growing fresh food in the market. You know, right. when, when, when buildings are covered in trees and plants, I know so there's two or three skyscrapers going up in, in, in Brisbane like that. Built, the cities are going to be so beautiful compared to what they are today. Sure. These, these horrible glass concrete monuments. Yeah. Darren, well, do you want to say something? Oh, look, just talking about that, one of the roles that Australia's always had is often we may not be the place that, that, um, that actually runs the technology first, but we're developing it. And I know of startups in Melbourne that are doing, you know, vertical farming and, and, um, and you know, highly automated and those sort of things. And they're actually got to focus on selling it back into Asia. So right. we're doing a lot of that. But at the same time, then we're seeing other developments where you're taking uh, the CO2 from, um, say, from methane production off the back of a, of a dairy farm and pumping it back into the, to a glasshouse for greater um, growth rate. So the stuff is happening here, and I think we're going to see more of it happening. And it's about, you know, don't fear the, per the kid in the hoodie. 
I think there's people looking at this saying that they're breaking the ideas and saying, well, I want to be a farmer. And I suppose if I go back to, to my roots, oh, I wanted to be a farmer, but you know, things happen, you end up in different places. But there's a way to be involved in agriculture and food that doesn't mean you have to own a farm and be in a regional area. Well, it sounds like, well, uh, again, not to be too confrontational, but we might not be owning the farms because of overseas investment, as an example. We might need to be doing something else. Yeah. Now, why, are, why, in your opinion, do you think that uh, international companies are buying in Australia? Look, Australia's we've got a stable government. We've got a um, relatively stable climate. Um, we've got a relatively just stable society. And if you look at both in Australia and New Zealand, I think you're seeing that as being, when you look around the world, it's ripe for investment. It also seems like those countries need the land and they're buying it somewhere else. Look, uh, China and India cannot feed themselves come mid-century. China definitely knows that. India is starting to suspect that. If we're not going to see refugees of the order of a billion moving into other countries, we're going to have to do something to prop up their food systems. Either grow it here and ship it there, or else help them. I mean, Australians are past masters at the management of water and nutrients. We're very, very good at that. So we've got a lot of intellectual property that we can contribute to the world task of feeding humanity. If we don't feed humanity, we're going to have a lot of conflict. That's the bottom line here. We, we, we've got to make sure all countries, not just us. Yeah, James? I think that's a very good point, but I think, I mean, I think the issue is that we have enormous potential to grow more food, but it requires capital and it requires people to take risk. And that's really hard when we've got so much of our Australian agriculture based on the, far family, on the basis of the family farm where it's really hard to do that. And so that's why I think we're seeing you know, equity coming in and, and people are saying, well, if you don't do it, we'll come and do it either with you. And as to Julian's point, if we don't do it with them, they'll, they'll, they'll just, just do it do regardless. It anyway. yeah. So it, again, it's a real challenge and an opportunity for Australian agriculture. If I could give you an example, um, Jeff Bezos, the, the, uh, the billionaire owner of Amazon, is investing in vertical farms. And he's part of a company whose plan is to put a vertical farm into every city on earth. Uh, you know, I mean, that's how big these guys are thinking. So there is a lot of capital. And I think that people are becoming quite excited by horticulture, by intensive horticulture of this ilk now. So capital is being attracted to this area. A lot of this capital is going to be lost. There's going to be a lot of failures on the way. We know that in agriculture and in high tech. There's a lot of failures. But it's got to succeed in the end, otherwise we can't feed ourselves. But it does seem like we're in a very lucky situation where we've got a lot of land and so on uh, in the way we're working, a lot of water and a lot of nutrients, as you've said. And a lot of wisdom. A lot, there's a lot between the grower's ears yeah. here that, that, that is very valuable. And I wonder if this is a... It's not necessarily marketing, but it might be a lobbying thing in this case, Darren. I mean, how much do we need to lobby the regulatory agencies to say we can't just sit back and, in this case, you know, rely on the wheat fields rather than the, the, the sheep's back? Look, I'd almost rather rely on, on business to get it right than government to get it right. Um, there's a strong case in there when you look at the relationships and the businesses that are forming, they're kind of skipping the governments. We're seeing businesses that are operating across multiple countries, um, they're setting up their own supply chains. And again, you look at it, someone like Amazon, they're not in our space, but they're kind of skipping the whole government idea and they're just going with, yeah. with where they want to go. Yeah. Um, when you look at the supply chains that are developing and the technologies that are coming, you know, blockchain, internet of things, um, you can throw them in as buzzwords, but they're real tools that are going to become part of, of what we're doing. Um, you're seeing these supply chains where people want to have more trust and understanding of where the product came from. So I think that, you know, to a, to a degree, the governments are becoming a little bit irrelevant in it, and the power of the consumer having a gigantic conversation that we're not even part of a lot of the time, um, which is out there, you look at everything from MasterChef to, to just Instagram, you know, blows the doors off the discussions that, been, that are being had in Canberra and other capital cities well, around I, the world. I know that every time there's a show, there's a recipe, and then Coles have got the ingredients. They do. Right, every single time. I mean, it's very clever that you've got a whole chain of marketing there. Let's talk about marketing. How important is marketing going to be in helping us achieve the goal of do doubling productivity and reducing waste? It's, it's huge because it's a way of not only communicating with the consumer what they should be eating, and one of the challenges we've got is we're not eating enough fruit and veggies. Yep. Um, you see the work CSIRO is doing and, and other groups of saying, how do we incorporate um, uh, fruit and veggies into a diet? But if you look more broadly, it's just that there are really good messages out there about it, uh, about, about eating more fruit and veggies, but people aren't getting it. Um, there's new workers coming out now which is talking about actually how you feel. And so it's not about saying, if you eat 
you know, your, your five and two a day and all those sorts of you'll things, feel you will, you'll feel better, you'll be healthier and you'll live longer. Yep. That's not working a lot of the time. We're seeing work come out now that says if you increase the number of, of serves of fruit and veg you have, you'll actually feel happier. Right. Along the lines of going from, and it was a report I read last week saying, you're, it's equivalent to going from unemployed to employed. So if you think about that, that's yeah, it's true. That's good. That's a kick. You're going yet, to get that. Yet it feels like the, what we're talking about. The marketing feels like how important superannuation is. It's not important until you're 60, yep. right? Right now, I just oh, I'm getting close to that. <laughs> but right now, let's say a 30 year old doesn't care yeah. because they're feeling healthy anyway. So how do you actually counter that? How do you counter the long term? But you're going to people live eat differently these days, and I even see I can see it in the PMA office. Um, you know what I'm having for lunch, what my colleagues are having for lunch, and there's a bit of a time step in, in age. And you look at it and go, things just change. Yep. But the way the marketers are going about it, and I, I flagged it um, earlier, our market of the year awards. You look at the efforts that people in the produce industry are going towards of, of targeting the marketing and the product that goes behind it and the food safety that puts the integrity. Yeah. Well, it's, a good, it's the provenance good, bit. Good example of that would have been the avocado industry, right? Yep. Okay, and they've spent 15 years basically getting. Um, people to the stage where they recognise that avocado is really part of the diet. And including, you know, the Bernard Salts of the world who have made a joke about the fact that, you know, you go to any hipster cafe and you know when the hipster cafe will stop because of the avocado and feta cheese curtain, right, when it stops doing that. Now, all of a sudden, I, I think one of the things he got canned for was the fact that, you know, if, they st if young people, young people stopped um, eating out all the time, they'd be able to buy a house. In fact, I was one of those, right? I used to have avocado on toast all the time, mate. And now I just do it at home because I realised that I could save myself 20 bucks every weekend. And I've done that, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I've done that and I've now, like Bernard Solder said, I have got enough money to buy a house. And here's the house that I bought by not eating avocado. <laughs> Um, just as a, as a starting point, right? But it's true, that shows how powerful marketing can be because avocado has become a staple. I think the part of it is that it's not only just the marketing, and one of the things that's easy to focus on is the production end. And we need the whole supply chain, and we need people with all the skills that come in there from, from farming to processing to growing to logistics, because you have to get it to the people. Now, the idea of having that in the city doesn't change it. No. It just changes the way that chain looks, but it's a very real way. Oh, it's quicker. You can actually say this is very local. Yep. Right. At the moment, marketing, the marketing messages reaching the consumer are overwhelmingly about crap. They're about that diet Crap. that's killing people, yeah. right? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, we know it's killing people. Uh, what we have to do, and I've called for this several times, is we need a year of food in every primary school on the planet. Otherwise, we will have a generation of uninformed consumers who send the wrong economic message to the farmer about what to grow. Yeah. So we need, first of all, to start educating. We need the Stephanie Alexander model of a, a farm in every primary school. And they're doing that. Uh, they are, yeah. and when kids grow their own veggies, they eat vegetables. Guess what? Brussels sprouts and broccoli become delicious to them. You know, so, so you know, once we can introduce them to how things are actually grown and all the diversity of food that they can raise themselves, it completely changes their attitude away from these fried, fried, fried Jim, fatty things. Jimmy, we're, can, can we have Brussels sprouts genetically modified to taste like they've been fried in bacon? I, I don't think you can do anything to Brussels sprouts, mate, to make it taste good, in my, uh, my opinion. Actually, actually can, we, can we push that a little bit? Because it is about understanding what the consumer wants. Uh, and in the past, it used to be just cheap. Now it needs to be heirloom and cheap and organic and cheap. And all of this, we're seeing that drive. But, you know, uh, the, the thing that comes to mind is returns to growers is already low, right? A lot of the time you hear these stories where... Um, in primary industry, the returns to the people who are actually doing the work is not as high as it should be. Um, uh, so to push, a, again, a confrontational question, why, why should we be increasing productivity? If you think of the supply and demand model, that's all that's going to do is push prices down. Well, I think if you think of your marketplaces within a 20 kilometre radius, then perhaps that, that is a fair question. But clearly uh, there is a conundrum to solved, there's a balance we've got to find between making sure growers are pr productive and profitable because who else is going to invest in their farm and what else are they going to do it with other than with profits. So we need to have growers profitable, but we also need to meet this food challenge. So, you know, to say, well, we're going to uh, assume that our marketplace is within 20 kilometres and so we're not going to grow too much because we want to keep the price high, is why we'll have foreign investors coming and taking our land because we, we, we will fail our, our global obligation, I guess. And that sounds a bit altruistic, but I think fundamentally, you know, we are in the business of, of feeding you know, our fair share of the population. Yeah. Jimmy, can I go remember, to you? you you've got a global perspective. Remember yeah. that producing more 
or having higher yields is not your choice. If you don't do it, someone else will do it. So somewhere else will bring that to the market. So you just need to compete with other people. How do you balance that concept of higher yields with the fact that you've got 27,000, was that the number? 27,000 plants that we could be eating and creating a diverse uh, set of behaviours from the person who's consuming them? I've been an ag journo for more than 40 years, and I've got to say the productivity argument is one of the worst arguments I've ever heard. I mean, just pushing up yields does not solve the problem of food. Getting very high yields of corn is not going to feed Africa, for example. The average African farm well, produces more nutrition. Yes, yeah, simplistically, yeah. why not? Well, why not? Because corn is not very good to eat, actually. It's not very nutritious. You get a whole lot of diseases if you just eat corn. Um, so a small African smallholder farm will, will have a much more diverse array of fruits and vegetables and livestock on it, a tiny little farm. So Amitav Ghosh, the Nobel Prize winner, showed that you get more nutrition out of a small farm than you do out of a big broad acre farm. And broad acre farms are going to be incredibly vulnerable to climate change. But two degrees of climate change are locked in now, so it's going to get very tough farming outdoors by the mid-century and almost impossible by the end of the century. So, so we've got to look at different ways of doing so this. So a grower who's had a family business for the last 100 years or something needs to be able to change and capitalise on that. Yeah, but look, if this was 1918, you'd be saying to growers, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get rid of your horses. And they would be shocked and horrified and replace them with this thing called a tractor. Okay, we... we Farmers go through technology revolutions all the time. They're quite capable of doing it. They're very good at doing it. Uh, this is just another revolution, but it must not be driven by these giant food companies who want to screw the price of food down. We have got to get the price of food up so farmers can farm sustainably sure. and look after the water and the trees and the biodiversity. I'm just checking the audience. To thank you. I'm, uh, thank you very much. I, I am also just checking the audience to see who's not applauding uh, because they're members of those giant food companies. <laughs> just to the, <laughs> I thought I'd check. This, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting comment, yeah. The space about value is an interesting one because the, the other side of the coin is waste. And one of the things is that with food being cheap, it can be easy to waste it. And so everyone knows that you're probably all guilty, and I am, that the, the crisper section of your fridge has probably got a couple of bendy carrots in the bottom and a few things like that that are going to get chucked out. And it, it comes down to how do you value them. And I think changing the mindset about how you value it as it's just a carrot through to it's a carrot with a high dollar value through yeah. it's my pathway to being healthier and happier. Well, it's a different mindset there. I'm going to go to Jimmy in a second on this one. Can we develop a carrot that doesn't go bendy? Yes, we can. That shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, the problem that we have is that we can manipulate a lot of stuff now. We can improve a lot of things, but uh, there is obviously this big public debate about you know whether this is not a natural carrot anymore versus being a natural carrot. That is a concept that I really enjoy the natural thing because there is nothing more natural than a tsunami. Um, a tsunami. That doesn't mean it's good, <laughs> all right? Um, or malaria. Malaria is completely natural. Nothing man-made about malaria. <laughs> so this fact that natural is good is, is in everybody's mind, you know. This is a natural food. Look, in Australia, we sell a toilet paper that is all natural. The paper's paper. Um, comes from yeah, well, I mean, a toilet paper that is all natural, what is it? Do you see that growing in trees, you know? It's, it's this concept that we have. So technology can come to our help, and we can make tomatoes. I've, I've, I've seen tomatoes that actually last for months yeah. because they have slowed down the ripening process to such a way that it just lasts forever. Uh, but it's not natural because it's GM. And it's not tasty, maybe. Uh, or is actually, it tasty? it's a lot more tasty than the normal one. Remember this, when you pick up a tomato and you pick it up green, yeah. in order to have time to commercialize it, the sugars are not in the fruit yet. The sugars come when you break color. So if you pick it very early, it will never taste good. So this comes down to consumer behavior, I think. If you look at a standard supply chain, you've got the producers, the organization in the middle, and the customers on the end. Um, what effect, what do we need to do to affect the consumer? And we're starting to see the behavior change. You said that lunch is different now, Darren, as an, as an example. But what kind of impact can we have that supports the horticultural industry further? So there's work being done on plant breeding and it's getting down to the stage where we're talking about having a profile for different groups of people. So there's been some work done. If you look at, you know, the, the ideal taste, um, sort of taste palettes, I suppose. If you look at, say, Europe versus America, surprise, surprise, America comes out wanting sweeter things. Yep. 
you know, Europe wants more savoury. So we're starting to get down to the point of actually thinking about how things taste. And for a while there, you know, tomatoes were like tennis balls. You could pretty much throw them around the supermarket, they'd bounce, put them back on the shelf and you're fine. Now logistically that's fantastic, but getting to the spot of where you talk about, is it delicious? So, so you want, need an heirloom tomato? No, you don't need an heirloom right. tomato, but you need one that tastes like an heirloom tomato. Okay. And so, but if you take a, um, a category at the moment, and look, I, I spoke about raspberries before, um, which is just a nice little story, but raspberries right now are tasting fantastic. They and do. they're ones that you're grabbing. You were I had one last oh night. My, oh my goodness. <coughs> they, to, to the people of perfection. To wherever I, I think stole it was perfection, them last I stole night, them. So, I stole um, them from your stand <laughs> last night because they're like, they're plump and yeah. they're, they're like lollies. Yeah, they're tart and so, sweet and, and, and me, firm at the and same time. I'm, excuse me, I'm just having a moment. Right. The word delicious comes back in there. Yeah. And so for me, it's not a, um, I've got little kids and I go, right, I want, you want them eating things that are good and healthy, you want them eating fruit and veggies, stuff like berries like that is so easy, you go, here you go kids. But that's a case where they've taken a product that used to be, um, you know, not that consistent on the shelf, but it is now. And that's about plant breeding, it's about the supply chains, a whole lot of things. And so you've got these bang on products. One of the best ways to increase consumption, which is a whole public health good, which ticks back into all the other things, is make it taste great. Yep. It's not a hard decision to go, well, I have another one of those apples if it tasted fantastic. Yep. And that's the whole supply chain. It's the, it's, you know, this part of it is the marketing end of it, of putting the story going, hey, this is something you want to try. Then behind it, it's the whole supply chain that gets it to you, which is, you know, and the retailers, um, big and small, all do a fantastic job of presenting their product. <clears throat> but behind that, the whole supply chain, right back to the grower. And I think having a good conversation about how the product gets there so that the consumer can trust it and make choices that are good for them, good for their wallet, but also good for their, and their health, I suppose, um, is a tough one, but it's an important one to have. Yeah. You know, well, let's play around with supply chain for a second. If you look at who the suppliers might be, uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is imports, being a major competitor. Um, I'm going to ask you, James, um, I mean, how do we counter that? Uh, I mean, Australian growers and Australian purchases are all about buying local, or Well, I they? think, yeah, I th and I think, I think consumers want to buy local, so we need to tell them what food is local and what food is imported and let the consumer make a choice. But if local is five bucks a kilo and imported well, is $1.50, well, what will it, well, I do? That's, unusual, that's not usually the case, but yep. where it is, there is a challenge for the gr for Australia to grow food that's competitive. I mean, we are we are a trading nation. We want access to overseas markets. We need overseas markets um, to help us grow um, our business. Uh, and you can't ask for overseas markets to grow and keep your own markets closed. It just doesn't work. So, the uh, the only answer that I can think of there is you've got to be have a product that's every bit as good as your as your competitor, whether your competitor is down the road or on the other side of the world. So we, part of this is talking about reducing wastage, halving wastage. I would imagine there's many opportunities to reduce wastage within a supply chain. What sort of ideas have you got there? Some of the simple ones come down to, I mean, a really simple idea is, is the discussion around best before dates. Um, and that comes back to your own fridge, which is one of the most wasteful inventions in the planet. Uh, we've got this space where people see a date on a package and that was past the date, throw it out. Um, and I know that's part of the conversation that's been looked at saying, do we remove those? Do we look at it and you know, put some skills in education, people can choose it themselves, but it's part of going, how do you, you know, look at waste? But even right through to these companies that are taking some of that waste and turning it into other products. Now the broccoli, the broccoli snacks you talked about before, um, but even into taking like a fresh cut company who then takes the peels and makes a stock and then you can do all these things. So it's sort of taking what may happen in an old kitchen that probably our grandmothers did. Used to do, yeah. But turning that into, making that scalable and, and, and across the supply chain. Julian, you got a comment on this? Yes, I do. Um, I was talking to the New Zealand dairy farmers only a couple of weeks ago about exactly the same thing. You guys are past masters at managing the flow of nutrients and water. That's what farmers do. They do it very well. You have got to get into the ear of the Brisbane City Council, the Sydney City Council, the Auckland City Council and say to them, no more organic waste, zero organic waste. It does not, I mean, at the moment, 40% of the farmer's efforts are going to landfill. That is bloody stupid. You know, we have got to put all of this stuff back into, re recycle into, into soil, into soil amendments, into food for prawns or uh, chickens or whatever it is you're going to feed on it. We've got to build these large recycling chains because we will not be able to feed ourselves come the mid-century so if saying, we don't do that. You're saying not just recycling plastics and metals, we're talking about recycling organic matter to create compost or whatever within a city environment. If I'm talking about the survival of civilization, I'm saying we have to recycle everything, absolutely everything, to go from a non-material, from a material to a non-material society. If we don't do that, we're in a lot of trouble. 
uh, but that, that's a, a complex argument. But farmers can influence the thinking of big city councils to allow urban agriculture to take place by recycling this vast volume. There's 120 billion tonnes of nitrogen goes through the world's cities every year, and mostly it ends up in the ocean. You know, this, this is just insane. And can I add one more thing? Sure. I was at the, at the, uh, the, the dietitians and the, and the nutritionists conference. There were no farmers at that conference. Okay, I wonder, I wonder how many dietitians and nutritionists are at this conference. Farmers and nutritionists have to start talking to one another and joining forces to build the diet that is going to prevent heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity. So you've got to have these conversations with the Brisbane City Council, with the dietitians, to design these diets of the future. See, that's interesting, isn't it, for an industry body as such, to be able to capitalise on that and say, what do people need to eat and we better bloody well grow for it? Absolutely, it's fabulous advice. I, yeah. mean, I agree. I mean, you know, we try at this convention, I think five or eight years ago, this was a convention primarily just with farmers. We're trying to take a whole of value chain approach, but I mean, getting all these ancillary voices um, to be heard in our industry is, is a great opportunity. And that is where technology can come to help because, you know, if we can make, you know, rice with high vitamin A, for example, content on them, so if we are seeing, you know, any kind of problems with the diet or whatever, there is a way to modify food in a way that contains more vitamins or start uh, having vitamins or proteins that are not normally there, we can put them there. Yeah, it does seem like, I keep coming back to um, individual behaviours as well. How do we s reduce waste? One is to get people to buy more often and that seems to be that the av average consumer behaviour now is I'll go to the supermarket and not buy for the week. I'll buy for the next two days or buy even just for tonight's dinner as an example. Maybe there's a supply chain conversation that's beyond the farm gate, beyond the distributor, and going more towards retailer to the customer. We've got it down to, um, to more meal solutions being delivered. So it's not even that you go shopping anymore, it could be that it's delivered with the portion control for what you're actually going to use for the meal. There's a, there's, um, it's probably caught on bigger uh, around the world, but what we're seeing, in, we're seeing that in Australia, it's being picked up now. Varying degrees of success. Um, it is a different way of shopping, that's one that's coming on, but I think we're just seeing that people, the way people eat and, and behave with food has changed a lot in recent years. It's going to continue. Can that be driven by a grower? Um, probably. Just to even, even to be able to, I'm just thinking about the fact that if we're talking about packaging this, whose responsibility is it? Well, but think about like cherry tomatoes, mm. things that you hadn't snacked on before, you know, in previous times. There's, there's a much broader palette of things that can be part of snacking and packaging and the way yeah. you get it to it. Yeah. yeah, no, I think Darren's right. I mean, there's, 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 just, there's lots of examples where, where growers are now thinking about how is this product going to be consumed um, tonight or tomorrow by a family and presenting the product yeah. so that it appeals to them, whereas yeah. in the past they might have grown a bulk commodity and shipped it off in to order to, for a distributor yeah. to do that work. So again, yeah. trying to get visibility down the value chain, understanding what consumer yeah. wants is critical. Julian? The reason that farmers get such bloody poor returns around the world is that there's a whole lot of people in the supply chain going down, 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 basically and they are taking your money. I mean, that's been going on for, for you know, 40, 50 years or more now. The answer to that is to fragment the supply chains, not consolidate them. It's only the people who want to make money out of food rather than nutrition out of food who, who are interested in these big supply chains. Fragment the supply. If there's only a webmaster and a bloke on a bicycle between you and the consumer, you know, you're going to get a lot more for your, for your broccoli or whatever it is that you're growing. So, so uh, you know... There's I think got to be a lot of bicycles though, Julian. That's I, I was about to say, there's a business there called Broccoli's on Bikes. but uh, Yeah. There's <laughs> a few O-bikes that are spare now. Yeah, so there are one or two, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a point of the idea being implementable. Uh, look, I'm not, I'm not sure that I, I buy Julian's argument entirely. I absolutely get this notion. I mean, you know, notions of driving prices down, ultimately the person at the start of the supply chain is going to really the bulk of that. I absolutely get that. Yeah. But I don't know that the answer is putting up more barriers and more smoke and mirrors. I mean, to me, the answer is, well, actually having a conversation with your supply chain partners about how we create value and how you share the value. Because I think putting up barriers just puts up inefficiencies and po actually probably builds in more costs. And actually doesn't, doesn't, isn't really the answer to actually feeding everybody, which yeah. is what our primary purpose is. We are changing, yeah, go on. I mean, it's also hitting back in a space, the idea about um, the smaller supply chain, which gets the conversation about local, which is something, again, a lot of people aspire to. Uh, I was at a conference in Chicago last year, and 
there was a bunch of people talking about, and there was a lot of chefs and, and food service people, and all talking about that their produce was local. When you ask them the question of what does local mean, and I've done the same thing here in Australia, you get in it, it the answer is it depends. Local could be, you know, if, if you're here in Brisbane, local might be 50 Ks. Yep. If you're talking to someone in Alaska, it could be, well, it's, you know, most of our continent. Um, yeah. There's a really different space about that, and there's, it's a big aspiration. A lot of people do want local, but then it comes down to what can they get? What does that mean they can eat? How does it change their life? And what are they, what are they happy to compromise with? So it's a, it's a different space. It's on from the farm gate, but it's a very different one. And how conducive local conditions are to growing whatever at the time, as an example. And maybe these urban-based farms where you've got some ability to control might be that. Um, look, let's just finish it off. What's, um, and this is the final question to all of you. If we're to focusing on doubling productivity and halving costs over the next 12 years, what would be one action or one item that you would personally recommend to the people in the audience that they could focus on to do that? Oh, look, I think, it's, I think we, we need, both individually and collectively, to have a very clear vision. I mean, that we've got a target that we've used as a conference theme, but what does that actually mean? And I think the opportunity, and I know the NFF are doing this as they try and think about a, you know, a, a national strategy for agriculture more broadly, we need, to have, we need to have a beacon, we need to have a light on the hill, and we need to know where we're going. And I, so I think that's really the job of organisations like ours is to, is to try and help formulate what that is. Yeah. Uh, what's, what I think is interesting is when you know what the light on top of the hill is, even if you're not all on the same pathway, you're at least heading in the same direction. Right, which is good. Thanks, James. Uh, thank you, James Whiteside. Um, Darren Keating, what about you? One, just taking part of the discussion, looking at the waste part, we'll probably talk more about the production part today. I think the waste part, there's a, there's a really important conversation to be had about packaging and waste and how that fits together. Um, I see a big conundrum there that you look at packaging is, is easy to call evil, but it's also the thing that can minimise food waste and, um, and have some really good impacts on it. And so there's a lot of positive things around it, but it's one now that, that's a big discussion. Um, it's something that everyone uses in every part of it because you're all moving products around there. So I think a, a higher level discussion about that and think about getting back to stuff that works and you know, actually fits in with what we're trying to do, but is sustainable in a way that works, so yeah. Dr. J thank you, Darren Keating. Dr. Jimmy Batella, what's your thought? I, I would encourage farmers to adopt technology and adopt technology early and come and talk to scientists. Uh, we are always looking for new challenges. So if you think that you have something interesting or you have a problem that needs solving, well, you come directly, talk to us, let us try to find a way to develop new ways um, so you can actually start as an early technology adopter. Um, and it sounds like there are PhD students just looking for a subject to write their thesis on as well and do their research. So that's part of it, yeah? I got too many PhD students now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Jimmy Batella and Julian Cribb. Yes. Um, Stop talking about agriculture and horticulture and start talking about food. You are a food producer. Food is what consumers eat. They don't eat agriculture, they don't eat horticulture, they eat food. You have to close the gap mentally and economically between yourself and the consumer to influence their behaviour so that they can influence your economics. If you don't do that, if there's a whole lot of people standing between you, you will never have control of this system. All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking our panel today, James Whiteside, Darren Keating, Jimmy Patella, and Julian Cribb. Thank you very much.